So, let us now take a look at uh, another component of uh, an instrument and um, its interaction with the electromagnetic radiation. To tell you very frankly, the we are talking about slits and there is no um, mechanical interaction except that the slits allow the radiation from one end uh, or to the other end. That is, it will allow the radiation to pass through with a fixed uh, aperture. So, usually in all spectrophotometers etcetera, you need two slits, one is entrance slit, another is the exit slit. Now, <laughs> if you take a look at this figure, there is a light source and there is a concave mirror here at the back side and then I have a slit in front of it and then it goes to a disperser like either a prism or a grating <laughs> and then after the dispersion the radiations come out and they are collected onto the another screen in which a slit is made. So, basically this slit gives a and uh, gives a mirror image uh, the image of the entrance slit is supposed to fall on the image of the exit slit. So, <laughs> the you can see that the function of the slit is to convert the radiations into a parallel beam of light. Now, you can see here also um, we can place a detector here. Um, or at the end of the exit slit and we can collect the radiation coming through the second slit. So, here in the bottom one we can have a multi channel detector which can collect all the wavelengths that are coming out from the disperser. For example, if you have a prism you will remember that 7 colors had come out of the white light and uh, same thing is true with uh, uh, diffraction units. So, if I can place a multi channel detector here at the end of the slit, I can collect all the information that is re related to the incident radiation. So, uh, the slits of a monochromator basically play a very important role in determining its performance characteristics and quality. Usually two slits are employed, one as the entrance slit which serves as the light source and another as the exit slit on which the image is formed. If the radiation source consists of a discrete wavelength, a series of rectangular images appears on the exit plane, which appear as bright lines corresponding to different wavelengths. Movement of the monochromator setting in one direction or the other produces a continuous increase, decrease, increase or decrease in the emitted intensity when the entrance slit image has moved a distance equal to its full width. What we mean by that is uh, having a slit here and then the radiation coming out will be like this and the here you would see that there is a wavelength corresponding to a maximum peak and uh, this is what we are we will be referring subsequently. And uh, so, illumination of the exit slit with the desired wavelength is invariably associated with some unwanted radiation as shown here lambda 1 and lambda 2, the which I did not show it there. This is known as bandwidth. For example, here you can see lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, here is mm, here this is the entrance slit and this is the exit slit. That means, one wavelength corresponding to lambda 2 is maximum here, but you cannot really avoid the contribution coming from lambda 1 and lambda 3, which is also collected from any given slit. This is a very natural phenomenon of all slits and uh, it is very important that the slit should be as small as possible to collect the uh, uh, wavelength uh, of the desired to collect the desired wavelength. Now, you can see here 
that uh, what is required is lambda 2, but some amount of um, uh, lambda 1 is coming, lambda 3 is coming and um, uh, this is uh, half width, uh, this is known as effective bandwidth and uh, <coughs> this area the um, uh, wavelength uh, wavelengths corresponding to all these three are known as bandwidth and this is half bandwidth effective bandwidth. Now, <coughs> the effective bandwidth is also called as spectral band pass or a spectral slit width. It is half of the bandwidth when the two slit widths are identical. It is very important two slit widths should be identical otherwise uh, you will not have a good uh, spectrum. When the effective bandwidth is decreased to one half the wavelength of the three beams, complete resolution can be obtained. Otherwise, there will be always bunching of the radiations that come uh, and uh, it would not give you the spectral purity. So, uh, that is another aspect. Now, let us look at what is known as a photoelectric effect. We are continuing our discussion based on the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with matter. Now, you would see that the photoelectric effect is a was discovered as far back as 1887 by Heinrich Hertz, who reported that a spark jumped more readily between two charge spheres when their surfaces were illuminated with light. Uh, you can see here this is a vacuum photo tube and um, here there are photons that is uh, light beams falling on a cathode and um, there is anode and this is uh, connected to a voltmeter and a variable voltage source and this uh, is a vacuum basically and then uh, emission now occurs here this is basically outer one is a basic glass or quartz tube. Now, in that we have fixed a cathode and there is an anode and uh, electrons are supposed to fly, uh, flow from cathode to anode and then we have a current meter to measure how much of the current is being generated. Now, this is basically a very simple thing and um, if the cathode is coated with a specific substance uh, like alkali metals or something like that, the electrons um, and you shine some light on this cathode, the current will increase that is the basic phenomena. So, electro that means electrons are jumping faster uh, to the anode and um, this phenomenon is known as photoelectric effect. So, photoelectric effect uh, is very know, well known since 1887 but only in 1905 Einstein offered a simple and elegant explanation for the photoelectric effect, but experimental confirmation again came only in 1916 with uh, Millikan systematic studies. We will not go into details of this uh, studies, but we will see that uh, the photoelectric effect is a very important phenomenon and several detectors work on this principle. So, what is photoelectric effect basically? When monochromatic light falls on a photocathode, electrons of varying kinetic energies are emitted from its surface and fly over to the anode in the phototube. As long as the voltage V is applied between the anode and cathode is positive it produces a current I in the circuit. Now, when the voltage across the photo tube is adjusted in such a way that the anode is negative and cathode becomes positive, then what happens is the electrons are repelled photo electron repelled by the anode and photo current decreases. At some stage if you keep on changing the, uh, the voltage the it stops the electrons will stop moving from anode to cathode. The photoelectric current therefore, is measured as a function of the applied voltage V 0 at which 
photoelectric current reaches 0 multiplied by and if you multiply this um, voltage with the electronic charge that is 1.60 into 10 raise to minus 19 coulombs etcetera. This gives the kinetic energy of the most energetic electrons in joules. So, with this principle when you measure the stop uh, stopped voltage multiplied by this it you can calculate what is the kinetic energy of the electrons generated in the photo tube. So, when maximum kinetic energy for various coatings are plotted as a function of the radiation frequency, because you know basically you are uh, introducing the uh, electromagnetic radiation making them fall on the cathode. So, when you do this and plot uh, as a function of radiation frequency, suppose that means you are taking radiation from different frequencies allowing them to fall on the cathode and then note down its kinetic energy or uh, voltage, then you plot those things. We get a straight line response uh, with a slope h um, and uh, with a, and an intercept. So, the uh, plots can be described by the equation k into E m is equal to h mu minus w, where w is a is called as work function. And you can also write the same equation as E is equal to k into E m plus w and that should be equal to h c by lambda that is Planck's constant characteristic uh, wavelength of the ray, um, velocity of the light and wavelength of the incoming radiation. The work function minus w is a characteristic of the surface material on which the cathode is coated. This represents the minimum energy of binding the electron to the metal atom. It is also equal to the energy of the electromagnetic radiation that is photon energy required to eject a photoelectron from the irradiated surface. So, what we can conclude out of this? It can be concluded that no electron can be ejected until the sum of the work function that is k into E m is realized. Therefore, the energy is not uniformly distributed over the beam front, but concentrated in packets or bundles of energy, which is basically what we are saying is energy is quantized. So, until you reach that energy, you cannot eject an electron. So, you have to keep on in giving the energy until that voltage is reached. Uh, only at that stage, electrons will start coming from the cathode and flow to the anode. So, this is essentially quantum mechanical theory, which therefore, the thumping confirmation of the quantum mechanical theory comes from this photoelectronic effect and this equation basically permits the this equation k into E m is plus w is equal to h c by lambda. This equation permits the calculation of the energy of any electromagnetic radiation of known frequency or wavelength and vice versa. Either you should know the energy, wavelength or frequency, then you can calculate the energy of the electromagnetic radiation. Take this uh, for example, take a look at this. Okay, we want to calculate the energy of 5.5 angstrom units of an X-ray photon. Now, what do we do? We basically write an equation like E is equal to h mu h which is equal to h c by lambda. Now, we know h, we know c and uh, lambda we know you just have to calculate energy. Now, substituting these values we get E is equal to 6.63 into 10 raise to minus 34 joule second that is the unit multiplied by 3 into 10 raise to 10 meters per second that is velocity of light divided by this uh, wavelength. Uh, we, you will see that we have converted that into meters. 
So, uh, what we get is 2.26 into 10 raise to 3 electron volts. So, the second uh, example I have taken to explain is to calculate the energy of 430 nanometer photon of visible radiation. First one was x-ray, second one is visible radiation. Now, uh, we use the same equation, put the values of E, the H and C and 430 nanometers, convert it into meters and then what you get is uh, this number multiply it by photons and um, you will get so many kilojoules per mole. So, for visible region we express it as the energy of the electromagnetic radiation we express it as kilojoules per mole whereas, for x radiation we express it in electron volts. So, this uh, aspect you should remember so, what is this uh, photoelectric effect. The quantum theory originally proposed for the black body radiation was extended to explain the emission and absorption of processes. The essential postulates of quantum theory we can say that one is ions, atoms and molecules exist only in certain energy levels. That is when it changes its state, it absorbs or emits the uh, an amount of energy exactly equal to the energy difference between the two states. During transition what happens? From one energy state to another, the frequency or the wavelength of the radiation emitted or absorbed which is related to the energy difference between the states by the equation E 1 minus E 2 is equal to H mu that is H c by lambda, where E 1 is the energy of the higher state and E 2 is the energy of the lower state. Now, this is very simple to understand. There are two energy states, one is E 1, another is E 2. The transition has to take place, but it will take place only when you supply an exactly known quantity of energy, then only the transition takes place. Suppose, you supply less, it would not happen. That is uh, for us to remember. So, the work function of every electro, every material is known and tabulated. Therefore, we can make detectors of different materials. So, uh, cont our continuing our discussion on this for atoms and ion or ions in the elemental state, the energy of any state arises from the movement of the electrons around the nucleus. Such energy levels are called as electronic energy levels. That means, all atoms and ions in the elemental state, either it is it may be in the gaseous state or uh, metal etcetera. Mm, the energy of the state arises from the movement of the electrons around the nucleus. Electrons keep on going round and round. The energy is always associated with the movement of the electrons and they are all placed in different orbits around the nucleus. Such energy levels are called as electronic energy levels. Now, molecules in addition to the electronic states exhibit quantized vibrational and rotational states arising from the rotation of the molecules or functional groups of molecules around their center of mass. Now, you can imagine that molecules are a group of atoms forming different uh, substances and um, each substance will have certain amount of spectra and um, so spectral characteristics. And, um, the apart from electronic states, we have vibrational and rotational states associated with each electronic level. For example, if you take only atoms, uh, ions, what happens is there is one electronic energy level, another electronic energy level here, another one will be at higher and higher energy levels. Whereas, with each electronic level, we have vibrational energy levels like this. This is the electronic level a middle one finger you can imagine the bottom one would be vibrational energy level, the top one will be a vibrational energy another vibrational level like that 
there will be a number of vibrational energy levels associated with each electronic vibrational energy. So, with same analogy can be extended further if you have a vibrational energy state again there would be number of uh, rotational energy levels. So, the spectrum of a molecule always contains electronic energy levels with each electronic level there are associated vibrational energy levels and with each vibrational energy level there would be number of still closely spaced rotational energy levels they are also quantized. So, the lowest energy state of an atom or a molecule exists at room temperature obviously, otherwise it will not be stable. It is this is called as ground state. Higher energy states are termed as excited states. So, when an electron jumps from ground state to next higher energy level, those states are known as excited energy levels and when it falls emits radiation, it falls to the lower energy level, still lower energy level, still lower energy level until it reaches a ground state as which is the lowest energy state. Detectors used in spectrophotometers infrared uh, fluorescent, infrared spectrometry, fluorescence, HPLC, they all work on the principle of photoelectric effect. These include barrier layer photovoltaic cells and then some of them are vacuum phototubes, photomultiplier tubes, diode array detectors etcetera. These things we will be studying when we are uh, studying the instrumentation of uh, uh, in equal instrumentation of uh, different uh, analytical technique. Now, let us look at the nature of interaction of radiation and matter that is a sample let us say. A sample can be subjected to a chemical stimuli in the form of heat or electrical energy or light or it can be bombarded or a it can be subjected to a chemical reaction. The stimulus should cause the analyte species to move from one energy state to another energy state. In this process energy is either absorbed or emitted or scattered. The absorption or and emission of the uh, energy takes place in quantas, but scattered radiation does not take place like that. Information about the analyte can be obtained by measuring the electromagnetic radiation that is either falling on the sample. Suppose, I have a sample electronic radiation is coming like this, part of it is absorbed, emitted or scattered and then part of the radiation would be going through the sample and collected on the other side. So, this information about the intensity or energy of the analyte can be obtained by measuring the electromagnetic radiation. For example, you can see here this is a basically an emission process. Here I have the sample, it, I am giving a stimuli here, it may be thermal, electrical or chemical energy and uh, here uh, the energy levels are there E 1 is equal to H mu 1 or H c by lambda 1. E 2 should be H mu 2 or H 2 H c by lambda 2, E 2 1 should be H mu and H c uh, H c by lambda 2 1. So, these are the different wavelengths that are coming out of the system. So, this is one type of uh, stimuli. <coughs> now, you can have absorption, then what happens? Incident radiation is there falling on the sample and then it is transmitted, part of it is transmitted, part of it is absorbed and you would see the spectrum here and this is the basic ground state, this is the excited state 1, this is the excited state 2, the electron can get excited from here to first uh, excited state and that is H c by lambda 1 and this is 
from here it can go to from the ground state it can even go up to second excited state or third excited state or fourth excited state like that which are placed above this. It is only mind you it should be it is all these notations are only theoretical that means we are pictorial representation of what is happening. So, <coughs> this is absorption. Now, emission of radiation when emission occurs excited ions or ions or molecules excited atoms they when they return to the ground state excess energy is also emitted as heat of the as heat or in the form of photons it may be either heat the material may get heated or some light may come out of the system. The excitation can be brought about by these techniques bombard you can pro probably bombard the electrons um, bombard with electrons or other elementary particles like helium particles neutrons etcetera this gives rise to x rays x radiation. Now, you can pass electric current or AC spark or heat source such as DC arc or furnace put it in the furnace this gives rise to ultraviolet visible or infrared radiation. You can also excite the um, uh, excite a material by passing a beam of electromagnetic radiation this produces fluorescence it is very simple. Now, we the fluorescence something like this you have a radiation falling on the this and then it goes to the next excited state and then uh, part of uh, when it comes back to the ground state it does not emit the radiation corresponding to uh, h c by lambda, but it corresponds to h c by lambda 1. That means, the incident radiation is not emitted, but a radiation of some other wavelength that is being emitted. So, this is known as fluorescence. Mm, this is bad. So, what is the difference between absorbance, absorption and fluorescence? Absorption is part of the energy is absorbed and when it comes back the energy is lost either as heat or simply the intensity of the radiation is lost. Now, in fluorescence when you are uh, uh, exciting the molecule you take a particular radiation falling on to the on the sample and then molecules will go to the the electrons will go to the next higher energy state lose part of their energy comes back to the ground state and during that process the excess energy is not lost as heat, but as a radiation of another wavelength that is lambda 1 what you saw here. So, this is known as fluorescence uh, another phenomenon. So, the, this produces fluorescence uh, sometimes what we do is we take exothermic re we reaction and uh, in exothermic reaction we make a substance to undergo a reaction by supplying energy and the substance goes to another state S 1. From here it undergoes a reaction and then gives out the radiation corresponding to a a specific energy and because of the reaction the radiation emission occurs and this is important uh, in some of the analytical um, techniques also and um, basically this is known as chemiluminescence. So, what happens when excited atoms ions or molecules are 
uh, returning to the ground state, if it the energy is very high, this gives rise to x ray radiation x rays, and if it is uh, less, the uh, ultraviolet visible infrared uh, radiation it may come out, and then if uh, the beam of radiation comes out of different wavelength, then it is known as fluorescence. And when you subject a substance to a chemical reaction, it may produce a ele an electromagnetic radiation corresponding to different wavelengths and that is known as chemiluminescence. This is also a very important factor, especially in the determination of gases like NOx etcetera in the environment. We will may be studying this in our course uh, if the time permits. Now, you can see that absorption spectrum uh, basically is uh, uh, occurs for the case of atoms, ions, molecules etcetera, when uh, the uh, electromagnetic radiation promotes the outer electrons to higher energy excited states according to the laws of quantum mechanics. The energy difference corresponding to each excitation is unique for each species. This permits the characterization of the sample. For example, uh, it may the energy difference may correspond to a functional group such as uh, carbon uh, CO or OH groups or COOH or uh, uh, ester something like that. So, if there is any specific change corresponding to a functional group existing in a molecule, the absorption can be used uh, for uh, the characterization of the sample straight away. This is usually accomplished by plotting absorbance as a function of wavelength or frequency. An absorption spectra differs widely or sorry the ab absorption spectra of different compounds differ widely in appearance from sharp peaks to smooth continuous curves depending upon its physical state, complexity of the molecule and the environment of the sample that is what we call matrix. Now, you can see that a substance may be uh, in the form of gaseous substance or it may be a liquid or it may be a solid. Now, the, uh, the environment in which the sample is there is also very important because the environment may influence the uh, spectrum and the spectral behavior subsequently. So, what happens atomic spectra of an element results in only a few simple and excite a few simple and excitations uh, simple lines and excitation can occur only at electronic energy levels of the outermost or bonding electrons only. So, for atoms for elements only the electronic spectra are possible. Now, what happens to a molecule? there are electrons in the molecules also. So, electronic spectra changes must take place whenever we let the electromagnetic radiation pass through the sample, but they, uh, there are they are usually more complex especially uh, because of the presence of functional groups and what happens to these functional groups? They have um, vibrational and rotational energy states and which are quantized. So, any electronic excitation energy any electronic excitation would lead to changes in the vibrational as well as rotational energy levels. So, the energy of vibrational transition is much more than that of rotational transitions. Now, you can see that the energy corresponding to electronic transition is higher than the vibrational and vibrational uh, transitional energy is much higher than the rotational transitions. So, <coughs> molecular absorption peaks involving electronic energy 
fairly are fairly broad owing to the presence of these vibrational and rotational energy levels associated with them. As a result, the spectrum of a compound consists of a number of closely spaced absorption lines that constitute a broad and smooth curve giving the impression of a continuum spectrum only, continuous spectrum. But absorption of pure vibrational energy is the basis of infrared spectroscopy and the pure rotational absorption spectra are observed in microwave region. <coughs> now, electronic spectral transitions in ions and molecules gives rise to spectrophotometry. That means, in spectrophotometry what we would be studying are the electronic transitions. So, the wavelength of the energy source does not change here. That means, we pass a electromagnetic radiation of a known wavelength and it passes through a substance and then it goes uh, out of the substance. The substance absorbs part of the energy and the difference between the intensity of the incident light as well as the uh, uh, transmitted light is measured as a function of the concentration of the substance. This is known as spectrophotometry. Now, the spectrophotometry can, can be in UV range region as well as invisible region. So, the, uh, the there are spectrophotometers which are dedicated visible spectrophotometers or combining both that is ultraviolet as well as the visible range. Sometimes the absorbed energy of a molecule is re emitted as a radiation of lower frequency or longer wavelength. This I have already I have already explained to you this and this results in fluorescence phenomenon. Sometimes what happens is the energy changes occurring in the electrons and nuclei under a strong magnetic field are best studied by nuclear resonance or electron spin resonance. Even the atomic lines, um, atomic excitation that is electronic excitations when they are conducted under a strong magnetic field, again they split uh, in um, the magnetic field that is known as Zeeman effect that we will be studying later subsequently when we are studying the atomic absorption spectrophotometry. At this point, it is uh, it's, uh, required for us to take a look at what we have learnt so far. Now, I want to summarize uh, part of the uh, learning what you have undergone since last uh, three lectures. Basically, we have started with the definition of analytical science. Now, there is a minute small beautiful difference between analytical science and analytical chemistry. Basically, analytical science is a dynamic changing field called upon to solve several kinds of problems mentioned above the <coughs> with the technology that constantly provides new measurement tools. The challenges extend from the identification and measurements of parts per billion levels and sometimes parts per million levels, sometimes in milligrams levels etcetera in various matrices. The example I have given you include the automobile exhaust and uh, the APXS analysis on the moon and then another example what I have given you is about the determination of fluoride by the SPADNS method. All these examples represent various facets of different kinds of uh, analytical challenges faced in the modern times. Another example which I have given you very uh, uh, subsequently is about the dimethyl glyoxime analysis for the nickel and palladium. Till 1970, this method was employed 
for the determination of nickel when it was replaced by flame atomic absorption and the challenges what uh, they have been handled since that time are mostly with the use of analytical instruments and that too modern instrumental methods of analysis etcetera. So, what I, we have achieved basically is to understand the base, some of the basic steps in the uh, obtaining in obtaining an analytical perspective that is approximately equivalent to analytical approach. What are those things? One is identification and defining the problem. This has to be done by the analyst and design the experimental procedure including sampling, pretreatment and chemical analysis. And third uh, aspect is carry out the experiments and gather the data. Then this is followed by the analysis of the experimental data and presenting a solution to the problem. So, we have <coughs> uh, considered different uh, challenging situations. Some of them include resolving the contradictory evidence of a sportsman taking steroids and another is evaluating the endosulfan exposure for uh, humans, children and pregnant ladies and then developing rapid and relative detectors for chemical warfare or online analysis of the environment and then real time modeling and monitoring of the <coughs> oil spill near a port and developing miniaturized sensors for real time analysis. Now, what are the analysts uh, strong points? They include accuracy, precision, sensitivity and detection limit. And the requirement is all the um, amount of the sample that is available and collection, storage, transport and pretreatment of the sample has to be finalized by the analyst. Third is number of samples to be analyzed. This is another aspect that is to be decided by the um, analyst. Then follows validation of the method, report presentation, cost considerations based on the above etcetera. So, we have looked at some of the definitions subsequently which you should feel comfortable because we are going to choose use the choose and use the uh, units quite often some of the num some of the words specific to the analytical science include sample assay validation followed by interference interferent methods of protoc methods or protocol atomic mass atomic weight mole weight percent volume percent ppm PPB, parts per billion and then parts per trillion, molarity, normality, all these things you would have studied in your high school and in your college level and those things we have seen. Subsequently, we have seen the basic classification of an analytical science that is classical methods and instrumental methods. And in the instrumental methods, we have seen number of uh, uh, methods that are used based upon the chemical principles as well as <coughs> the equipments that we use quite often across the board. Now, we also we in the second uh, lecture we have seen that most of the in uh, analytic modern instrumental methods of analysis relate to the changes taking place in the atomic uh, levels. Therefore, we have studied some part of the, uh, so we have spent some time in studying the atomic structure. There we have seen Dalton's theory and then we know what are the fundamental particles that are electrons, protons, neutrons, positrons, neutrinos, anti neutrinos, mesons, deuteron, alpha particles, etcetera. And then we have studied what is the modern atomic theory based on uh, Dalton's uh, uh, hypothesis 
and we have studied the nuclear structure followed by the typical nuclear reactions which are initiated by beta emission, neutron emission, positron emission, orbital electron capture and proton emission. And then we have uh, studied the different kinds of uh, nuclear reactions that can happen uh, by either capture reactions, particle particle interactions, fission reactions, spallation followed by fusion reactions. In all these things whenever nuclear changes take place there is a conversion factor we have used Newton's conversion factor that is E is equal to m c square that is the release of energy taking place in the form of heat or as radiations. The mass change corresponding to the conversion of hydrogen into helium is approximately we have studied that it is 0 0.0.0302 AMU which is equivalent to 28.12 mega MeV of the energy per uh, helium atom or 6.45 into 10 raise to kilocalories per gram atom of the helium. That means, which is equivalent this is equivalent to the temperatures prevailing on the sun. So, the nuclear reactions are also very important for us and there are analytical uh, uh, determinations required in handling the nuclear reactions also. Subsequently, we have moved over to the electronic structure of the atoms and there we have studied the Rutherford uh, uh, model and sub some of the experimental uh, evidences obtained by Sir J. J. Thompson have been utilized in arriving at a typical electronic structure of an atom around the nucleus. So, basically Bohr's theory it says that the electrons go round and round the nucleus which is uh, at the center and most of the orbits the electrons keep, keep on encircling the nucleus at a very high rate equivalent to m v r is equal to n h upon 2 pi which we call quantized. And he also postulated that as long as the electron remained at a given orbit it neither radiates energy nor it absorbs the energy. So, when the electron moves from one orbit to another it is considered to <coughs> change uh, the quantum number and we have seen the basis of all this is the spectrum of hydrogen atom which corresponds to Lyman series, Balmer series, Pustin series, bracket series and fund series. And um, based on these things we have arrived at the electronic distribution in the atoms that is first thing is rule of 8 that is inert gas atoms with the exception of helium contain 8 electrons in their outermost orbit. And, um, these elements are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon etcetera. And then we have arrived at the different uh, populations of maximum number of electrons 2, 8, 18 and 32. And um, then these electronic configurations of uh, inert gas atoms we have seen, subdivision of the electronic groups we have seen and uh, the electrons uh, movement are best described in terms of four quantum numbers that is principal quantum number, orbital angular uh, momentum, then magnetic quantum number followed by the spin quantum number. Based on this we have come to we have arrived at the conclusion that no two electrons in an atom can have the same quantum numbers and the spectroscopy is uh, of all the atoms is based on the changes in the energy levels of the electrons at different uh, levels. So, the interaction of it electromagnetic radiation uh, with matter has assumed uh, enormous importance for us and we have spent some time in understanding these interactions. Basically, we have seen that electromagnetic radiation acoustic waves, ion beams, electron beams etcetera represent a form of energy. A majority of the modern instruments are based on the 
interaction of the electromagnetic radiation with the sample. Analytical science dealing with such inter, uh, interactions is known as spectroscopy. So, we have looked at the several properties of the electromagnetic uh, radiation that is uh, uh, ranges, electron reactions, frequencies, wavelengths and the <coughs> how an electromagnetic mo radiation moves along as a either as a wave or as a particle. And um, we have seen the uh, equations for representing these reactions and then we have also looked at how the energy of an electromagnetic radiation can be calculated if we know the wa wavelength or frequency that is E is equal to H c by lambda where H is Planck's constant, C is the velocity of light and lambda is the wavelength. And then we have looked at the other types of interactions where there is refraction and reflection and polarization of radiations, transmission of radiations through a prism <coughs> or through a grating and we have also seen what are the different types of the uh, reactions that can be happening <coughs> in a, when the matter interacts with different kinds of prisms and gratings and slits or how the sp spectrum is obtained, what is the band pass width, what is the uh, half width etcetera and all these things we are going to consider subsequently in our uh, reactions, in our uh, studies using the modern instrumental methods of analysis. Another very, very important aspect that is uh, we have spent some time is to look at the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect even though discovered as early as 1887, it has uh, it simply uh, is one of the most wonderful things that has happened to the analytical science because when monochromatic light falls on a photo cathode, it releases the electrons and the release of electron corresponds to the in generation of the current. And this is the basis of uh, 90 percent of the detectors that we employ in most of our instruments. Basically, photoelectric current is measured as a function of the applied voltage V 0 at which photoelectric current reaches 0 multiplied by its electronic charge gives the kinetic energy of the most energetic electrons in joules. So, this maximum kinetic energy is uh, uh, can be plotted uh, and then the energy of the uh, slope is uh, given by the Planck's constant and the photon energy is required to uh, the intercept gives the photon energy required to eject the photo electron from the irradiated surface. So, we have done couple of examples to calculate the energy of 5.5 angstrom uh, x-ray radiation followed by one of uh, visible radiation. So, the quantum theory proposed originally for black body radiation has been extended to explain the emission and absorption processes. So, the essential postulates we have studied and at the end of that we have seen the different types of spectra, continuum spectra, band spectra and then line spectra etcetera. And with these um, systems we have studied the uh, requirements for different kinds of um, transitions that happen. One is atomic transitions, molecular transitions etcetera and these things give rise to various electro uh, spectroscopic techniques that is pure rotational absorption is observed in the microwave region and vibrational absorption spectrum is observed in the infrared region etcetera. And all these uh, changes that are taking place in an atom are usually studied by various kinds of modern instrumental methods of analysis and that we will be studying in the next class. We will start with the sp spectrophotometry.
in the next class. Thank you.